Good evening. Thank you so much for putting up with me and bearing with um, um, anybody who's just joined. I have just been, um, oh, my internet connection is unstable. Um, I really apologise. I'm at Birmingham for their AGM and despite sitting next to their router, um, it's not the my usual quality either of sound or um, some might say is a good thing um, or of um, uh, anything so hopefully we're going to be fine and I'm going to feel like um, Judith in the Isle of Skye um, and um, we'll be fine so I wanted to begin I, I um, where did this come from I feel very very inadequate giving this talk this evening because really about less than a year ago um, my best friend who lives in New York who often sends me things that she thinks I should read would be interesting sent me this amazing article from uh, the New Yorker about the woman that we're looking at um, tonight and when uh, Leah suggested when Rabbi Wolstein suggested that we should do this series this woman came to mind. And um, I thought that the best place to start actually is in the book that tells you so much about her. And um, in the best way of things to start right at the um, end of the book, um, a bit contrary like that. So I'm just gonna play something. It's the, the first bit of the end of, um, of um, the book by Ned Katz about um, her life and um, it speaks for itself. So I'm gonna play that and you're gonna tell me or by nodding your heads that you, you can hear it. Epilogue, Eve then, us now. It's daunting to follow atrocity with words. No language is adequate to Eve's cruel murder and the executions of millions. Silence seems more fitting. It gives us time to catch our breath. But after silence, words are called for. Emotions are, are not enough. Intellect is needed to contemplate what Eve's life might mean to each of us. First, it seems important to affirm that my writing this book and your reading it are not redemptive. Nothing can undo the barbaric crime that ended Eve's and so many others days on earth. Second, Eve would want us to remember, I believe, her resistant spirit and acts and her human complexities of character, as well as her cruel end. Eve's active life and involuntary death made me consider the relative weight each should play in my account of her. Certainly, justice required my fully reckoning with the Nazi monsters who had made her their prey. But would Eve have wanted her murder and murderers to define her life? She was a Holocaust victim, yes, but she was not only a Holocaust victim, she was also the complex, contradictory creator of herself. Without denying the barbarity of her death, I concluded that the focus of this history should be on Eve's acting in her world. Third, it's time that Eve got her due, her story told, and her killers named. She was murdered because she was Jewish but she fell into the path of the destroyers because she was a lesbian who dared to speak publicly in the United States for a love that was supposed to shut up. So it's that that really, um, I think, I hope, speaks to um, where we'll start um, tonight. So I'm going to share my screen and hope that that, oh, Tom, I'm not a co-host, I don't, am I my co-host? Can I share? Yes. Yes, you are. It's working. You. it's working now. Thank you. I feel very discombobulated not being in my uh, home surroundings. Isn't that funny? Um, okay, so here tonight to talk about Eve Adams. Um, and this is um, the beginning of her book, um, which was um, called Lesbian Love which was part of uh, the, the, her writing that ended up getting her expelled from the United States and led to um, her ending up back in, well, Poland and then to France, where in Nice she was deported, as we heard, and ended up in Auschwitz, um, where, she, um, where she was murdered. So her book begins, 
I didn't know where I was or what happened to me. It was a thing too sublime to give an account of. I still don't know. I often try to think and recollect, but in vain. All that I know is that it was one of the greatest and most significant events of my life, which will never be forgotten. And that the memories are always just beautiful. And you see it when you read her, her, her work, which is included in the book by Ned Katz. Um, she, she wasn't an amazing writer. I mean, maybe others would disagree, but she was certainly writing about her own experience, which she named, um, she gave everybody other names, but she was writing about something that had never been written about. And despite the fact that it's painted very dramatically, and we can see that through the documents from the US, even though it was um, painted as something very, uh, um, dirty and um, obscene, we can see that what she was writing about very much was about love and falling in love and the relationships between people. Um, so where does her story begin? And um, really important that we think about her life as, them, as Ned Katz says in that um, amazing epilogue that we just listened to. Eve was born in 1891. She was born in Poland to Mordecai Josef Sikoba and Miriam Ruchla Migdal and was given the name Chava. Um, at the age of 19 in Poland, and that's what that beginning bit that we just heard that I just read to you comes from, she has her first sexual experience with a woman who was in her 30s. And we think she was staying in a, in a, in a, in a, in a, a colony, in a, artist's colony and that this experience happened to her and we know that it's sometime while she was still in Poland before she set sail in 1912 to the US sailing from Antwerp in Belgium and on June the 4th 1912 she arrives in um, in the US and when she gets there it's obviously a very interesting um, historical time in the US and she begins to um, to get um, herself into um, into life in in uh, in New York, and she there were a lot of radicals. She'd been we know um, has remarkable how Ned Katz has pieced together an account of um, of of her life. He came across um, a vague mention of her in a book review in 2016, and Ned Katz was the author of Gay American History, and um, he was intrigued by this word lesbian in the word of in in um, in Eve's book, and he decided to go and um, research her, and um, she he managed to piece together a lot of um, documents and letters and um, of her of her story. And in this, he finds that she um, she first met um, Emma Goldman, another radical woman, very um, important in that period um, in American history, and also somebody who gets exiled from from uh, the States, although remarkably she, she is able to go back. Um, and she meets her at an anti-draft um, rally. And it was uh, um, there that she, she get, got more involved in uh, um, anarchists and organizers. And she come to uh, other, uh, um, the that was had put together. And she's very one of the reasons that Ned Katz was able to find out so much about her that the letters have been um, from Burn Control Acts uh, and less written, but also he writes about her and um, he, he, he uses her as the basis of some of his letters. Uh, he creates um, and, um, uh, one of his novels which was based on fictional characters of which one of them was um was uh was uh, masculine big nose and restless and in 1919 she becomes this traveling hawker of periodicals and see it um, 
identified. Know her by her hair. She has need her activity to good morning. She'll tell you how. Absolutely painless. And these were the great cards that she would leave in um, leave in uh, cafes and bars. Know her and come to her to buy her periodicals. Um, and. Uh, and on her because she had been with uh, uh, also new cats has brought together some of these findings that people um, had brought together about her and so partly because of this and one she can't significant is that she moved to York and head to ah my internet's not working oh goodness is it working now am I back Tom's moving for me nobody else is no Yeah. I don't think it's going to be good enough to get a session out of it. Um, I mean, now you're frozen, Charlie, and I can't hear you if you are talking. Um, I think possibly the connection is 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 bad enough that we we no. might have to postpone. Um, Charlie, can you hear me? I'm no, I'm so I'm very sorry, ladies and gentlemen, but this is uh, as it is in a different city. It's not even something that I can work on and uh, and try and try and improve. Um, Charlie, you're not plugged in, are you? And is there have they got an Ethernet cable that could plug you into the router? Just trying to do that. But I'm worried about not. I'm worried about knocking them all off the system. They've got their AGM upstairs. Um, I mean, if there, if, there are, if there are spare ports, Ethernet ports in the back of the router, and you don't unplug anything from the back of the router, you just plug into it and then plug it into your machine. Say that again. Say that again. Are there spare Ethernet ports in the back of the router? No, it's a tiny... Uh, oh, yes, maybe. Yes. So yes, if you can plug it, if you can plug into one of them and get that into your computer at the other end, then you should be on a wired connection. Is that bit, is that dumb? No, it's not working. It's not working as in you can't plug it into both. No. Because do you not do you have not have an Ethernet port on your laptop? I've got an Ethernet port. That's no problem. I've got a, I've got an adapter, but there isn't a cable spare cable. Oh, okay, fine, right, yeah. Okay. And I'm worried about pulling out the cable from one of them that I'm going to cut off the whole internet. Yeah, don't don't do that. It's likely that they're all being used for things. Um, I could run up if you'll bear with me. I will run upstairs and see if I can get someone to come and help me. Uh, would that be a better option than postponing until next week, maybe, when you're back at home? He's shaking their heads. Barbara is saying she can't make it next week and she desperately wants to be here for my session. And okay, I fine. So run, so run upstairs. Go, go, go. Okay. Then. Um, I've, I've clicked uh, allow participants to unmute themselves because you may as well chat amongst yourselves while this happens. Um, I do apologise about the technical issues we are having. It is normally something that we would have sorted out before the session, but as we said, Charlie was literally in the Birmingham AGM, so we didn't have a chance. It proves it's live, though, not recording. 
Yes, yes, absolutely. That's that's the most pos positive spin I could possibly have thought of. So thank <laughs> you so much for that. Um, yes, I don't know why that it was perfectly audible once I came in. I think possibly because the hosting was switching to me rather than Charlie and my connection is fine. Um, mm -hmm. I imagine that that's probably why. Um, I'm just going to look up the YouTube links for the session. I know we've definitely got two online already and the, the others are going up um, once they've been clipped. I'm really sorry. I don't seem to be able to get anybody who knows what they're doing. <laughs> is that they can't even they can't see where a cable is either no they handed me a, a thing like i have here but with no <laughs> okay so i'm really I mean, sorry barbara if i make it and i record it and i'll send it to you we will, oh, uh, yeah, they will, all, they will all be on YouTube and I'll make sure this one goes up very quickly because I know people are going to have to miss it if we postpone it to next week. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I think if we say, I'm ask, Charlie, I haven't got your diary in front of me, but I'm assuming next Wednesday will be okay. Um, and we will, um, yes, Bianca, I, sorry, I, I said I was getting that link now. Bear with me a moment. I will get the link to the YouTube that we, for the ones I we have already. We'll sort it. Yes, we'll put this session on next week and we will and we'll record it and we will get it. We'll get it up on the um I'm really sorry. This is this is the problem with going back to in person, right? This is the problem. When I'm at home, I can be in Birmingham and I can be with you. And this way, clearly. <laughs> I do my stand-up comedian that seems to that seems to work online. It only cuts off when I try and say anything, yeah. Smart. Um, I've just posted in the chat. That's that's the uh, YouTube link to the first two sessions. Um, we are getting the other ones up um, ASAP. We're just editing them um, and putting them up as well. And yeah, after next um, after next week, we will get Charlie's up very quickly. Um, thank oh, you. I'm talking before um, anybody tell me that, I, that nobody could hear me. That's what I really want to know. Uh, I was actually messaging you on the thing, but you weren't paying any attention, so that's why I switched to your phone. <laughs> I wasn't. Um, I'm not. I'm not sure, Karina. Um, because yeah, when I go quiet, then it, I think it switches to Charlie. That's the problem. And I don't know about the slides to talk through them with Charlie, so I don't think we can rely on them. Them. Can we try, Tom? I, I mean, yeah, absolutely, we can try. Um, what happens if I get it back up and you stay on and then you can share? means I have to stay on screen and that means I have to actually listen. But okay, fine. Yeah, it does. It's very exciting. Where did you? Where did we get to that anybody heard me? Um, the beginning of the slide you were on is when things just sort of went. So even when I first talked about her <laughs> first experiences, yeah? So shall I go back? No, 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 no. That, that slide, that slide, I think, I think we were fine during that slide where the first lesbian experience um, in the, in the colony, I think, I think was okay. The again. But then when you moved on to that, um, the, the slide after was when, it, was when we lost you. Here. So I just talk you through. Let's see if we can do it quick. We'll just do a bit. Can you hear me? For now. No? Um, yes. I can hear you. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> I've lost my whole red chain of thought. Ah, so it was very important when she came back to New York from um, Chicago, she um, realized that actually she needed to become a citizen. Not entirely sure why she didn't become a citizen 
happened in the lead up before, but here we have her declaration of intention to stay. And she was asked as part of this declaration of intention to stay, she was asked um, all sorts of questions about, um, you know, was she an anarchist? Was she there to overthrow um, America? Um, what were her, what were her, um, you know, am I not sharing my screen anymore? Tom? No, but I also think that may have been part of the problem. Ah, but then this, this doesn't, what I'm just saying now doesn't make any sense because you can't see it, does it? No. Should we try? Let's try. This is terrible, isn't it? This is like amateur hour. Um, really sorry. Don't like to do things like this at all. Here. Can we see this now? Yeah, we can. Yeah. So this here is her declaration um, of intention to stay. And um, she um, answered those uh, questions as best as she could. Um, and um, here, this down the bottom, these two photos are the same place. They are where she created um, her, her cafe. Um, her Eve's hangout where um, lots of artists and um, activists and particularly um, women would um, would hang out and drink tea. Um, so she'd ran in Chicago between 1921 and 1923. She'd run uh, Grey Cottage, which was the lead up really to her um, opening uh, Eve's hangout. Um, and um, when she left there, she returned back to Greenwich Village and she opened this place um, full of uh, Bohemians and um, New Yorkers. And it's interesting that this is where the beginning of the end really happens for Eve in terms of New York, because um, she there's an, an article which talks about this famous sign on the door that allegedly read, men are admitted, but not welcome and um, caused by a ring, a ring of rich women cultists and inviting mannish women preying on girls. And there was a lot of suggestion, particularly by Ned Katz, her um, biographer, that this actually never happened. There was never any sign up on the door like this, but this was the beginning of um, these articles in Variety who were trying really to, um, you know, were so uncomfortable with uh, the, um, the, the nature of this haven for lesbians, um, as well as this place where migrants and working class people, um, intellectuals, you know, all this lowest of the low would hang out, that really um, it appearing in variety like this was the beginning of the end um, for her. Um, so, but here in this, in this amazing hangout where she would organize concerts and readings, and it was considered to be a place where it was acceptable to talk about love between women, political, ma political matters, liberal ideas. And because of this, she became a really notable figure. Um, but there were a lot, like always, there were the enemies. So the, one of, um, when she was on trial, she was asked um, about whether, um, whether she was an enemy alien. And she replied that she wasn't an enemy alien, but the editor of the quill is an enemy of mine. And you can see from this, the sort of um, impression that the editor of the quill had towards women and particularly towards lesbians and particularly towards politically activist um, lesbians. And he wrote these awful articles about her and about the sexually radical bohemians. Um, and this led really to um, a whole collection by American security services into Eve, as well as others. I mean, you know, look, we know that there's a whole history of radicals being arrested within and um, but Eve covering both being politically a political activist, um, having a being what was considered deviant sexuality and also being a foreigner meant that she ticked three boxes really in terms of the establishment's feeling towards her. And this was really whipped up by uh, Robert Ed Edwards, who was the editor of The Quill. The other character that comes into play here for Eve is, um, should say, sorry, I kind of, one of the things that may have got missed, 
she changed her name partly because it was an Americanization, as we know, many Jews um, and immigrants changed their names when they came into, um, into the US. But also, if we think about the name Eve and Adams, it was an indication of her kind of non-binary identity that for um, Eve really wanted to play on this, both in the way that she dressed. If we look right at the beginning in this slide, we can see this is Eve and this is her, her long time companion. Um, and actually it's not known whether, you know, it was her long time um, uh, that they were in a relationship, whether that was sexual or friendship, I mean, not that it matters one way or another that we know about it, but she just talks about her long-term friend, this is Hela, who um, she is deported with in, um, in the end. But we can see how she dressed also here, which was um, in her um, photo with her brother and her sister. We can see this Eve in the middle was very keen that her dress was, um, it was not feminine in the classic sense that feminine was defined in those days. Um, and so when she chose the name Eve, Adams, she was really playing on this idea of both the Eve and Adam from, um, from uh, the Bible. And we can see all the way through her identity that her Judaism, even if it wasn't something um, religiously practiced, was certainly part of her um, identity at all times. Anyway, other characters that come in is Mrs. Mary Sullivan and uh, Margaret Leonard. Um, Mary Sullivan um, was... Um, the first uh, senior policewoman, um, we can read a lot about her, and she was part of, or led really, the investigation that sent a policewoman called Margaret Leonard into Eve's, um, into Eve's um, um, cafe to get to know um, Eve as a kind of setup. I mean, really, this is the stuff of plays. Um, and at um, Eve's subsequent trial, when she is arrested, one of the things she's arrested for was um, for um, trying to um, sexually attack um, Margaret Leonard, a young female policewoman who was sent in to, um, to attempt to take advantage of, um, of Eve um, as part of these drastic measures to try and clear up New York of its vicious moral perverts. And this was the wording that was used in um, in Eve's case around, um, around um, um, her trial. And so they arrested her both for this, but also for the publication of her book, Lesbian Love. It's 22 pages long. Lesbian Love is 22 pages long. It features four or five very short stories about, well, we think about relationships she had because Ned Katz does an amazing job in his book of trying to trace who those relationships might be. And um, he said, but for this book, which was considered filth and obscenity, um, she was arrested and combined with this young policewoman who said that she uh, she um, tried to jump her in um, in her hotel room, and um, uh, Eve vigorously denied um, the charges. But she was arrested, and she was sent. We can see here that this is her fingerprints from her um, arrest, and. She she was sent to um, jail. Now, why is Mae West here? Because in jail, she um, is there at the same time as Mae West. Now, we know that Mae West, or we may know that Mae West was jailed for 10 days for her play uh, Sex. And um, Eve, on the other hand, was jailed for a year. And when Mae West and her talked, um, Mae West was very clear that the reason that she got 10 days and um, for this 22-page book, um, lesbian love, um, uh, Eve Adams was jailed for over a year, um, was because it was about women rather than sex, which was, um, uh, well, we know what Mae West, um, so that's why Mae West is here, um, but Mae West was around, she also corresponded at great length with uh, Henry Miller, she was um, really um, fascinating in the book to see how many different people um, came across the path of Eve Adams, and yet she's so unwell known, um, you know, not the same um, knowledge as we have of other female figures. At the end of her jail sentence, she is deported and she was um, sent back to Poland. Remember, she was so young when she came to, when she came to um, the United States, that really the United States had been her home, it had been the 
place that she had dreamed of getting to as a place where she could really be herself and live the, the life that she wanted to. Um, and yet the US also, I mean, very interesting when you come to read her letters to Ben uh, Reitman when she's trying, when she first gets back to Poland, we can see that um, even though the States has treated her so badly that she was really for, for being a woman, for being an immigrant, for being a Jew, for being, uh, for, for her sexuality, for the way that she dressed, even though the US treated her so badly, she still longed to get back um, to the United States, even before it becomes apparent that Europe is becoming a very dangerous place for Jews. And when she first gets back, she writes to Ben Reitman. And she says, I feel a total stranger in my own country and in addition handicapped because I am a Jewess. In Poland, there are two races, Christians and Jews, and they don't mix. In all the world, a foreigner. And in the country I was born, a Jew. Very poignant. She was deported on December the 7th, 1927. She left the US on the steamship Polonia. Um, she goes to Danzig and then to Warsaw, where she works for a young girl as a, as a governess. Um, and she hates, she hates it. She hates the cold. She hates the people. She hates the, uh, the you know, life after, after New York. And so she's committed to try and get from there, um, at least to Europe. And so she makes it to Berlin and then to Paris. And um, in Paris, she makes a living selling Americans uh, what she calls dirty books. And she writes to her brother um, who is in um, Palestine um, and says that she's contemplating moving from there to either Moscow, although the weather one imagines would have been cold for her there as well, or to Tel Aviv. And by this time she's met Hella Olstein and um, she, she wants to move um, with her. Um, ben Reitman and her continue to write to each other, um, although she's very much writing to him, asking for help to get out of Europe, and he's very much writing to her with this idea of boxcar Bertha that um, I mentioned before. I'm not sure whether you heard me mention Tom's looking confused, so I'm assuming not. Boxcar Bertha was about these hoboettes that they were called, who would move from place to place selling um, periodicals and so he would write to um, Eve trying to get her to help him write this book about women I mean really he he tells her at one point she says that she's thinking about writing her autobiography and he tells her well women are far too preoccupied with themselves to really be able to write properly an autobiography you have to be very self-disciplined and you think here is this man who she's desperately writing to for help and he's so preoccupied with writing this book boxcar bertha that he seems to ignore all her pleas for what europe is becoming like in um, in this time and so he puts together this character or that becomes very famous of boxcar bertha in um, 1934, she writes to her brother, Yechmiel, in uh, Yiddish. He's, he's gone to Palestine, and again, she's trying to find out about life there, and she's looking for a way out of Europe. Hella worked as an actress, and her work begins to, um, to dry up, and they, you know, they can see what's coming. So they move to Nice, and somehow in Nice, they manage to evade the Nazis um, until December 1943, on December the 7th. Uh, age 52, she's living at uh, 10 Rue Alphonse car and she's arrested along with uh, um, Hella. And it's really been amazing that up until this time they've avoided because, well, we know the dates, right, in France, that this is that the fact that she'd somehow managed when other people from sim same address on the same street had previously been arrested. And we can see here now that now there is a, a plaque up to her on that place that this is... Um, that this is marked um, as, as where she lived um, from 1891 and she died in 1943. Again, the 7th of December, I mean, kind of amazing that um, uh, this date repeats a lot. Um, it's around Hanukkah time, um, anniversary of my bat mitzvah, maybe that's why it stays in my, my mind as well, but that um, she was assigned the number 9765 and was on transport number 63 to Auschwitz-Birkenau where she was murdered. And then her story remained really uncovered until um, Ned Katz and, and others began to um, slowly trace her history where really she should have been a much bigger um, figure in, in um, well, in, in both the revolution of sexual and gender identity, but also in 
um, in uh, you know her radical nature and her politics, um, which are fascinating. And I thought that the place I'm going very fast because I'm <laughs> before the internet dies again. But um, I thought where we'd end perhaps is that I might read you one of her um, her short um, stories um, and. Um, she um in this one she talks about uh, a hangout called the flowery teapot which we think is probably a reference to eve's hangout um, where she would make tea and this is um a story about sammy and um dotty um which um is one of the one of the stories that's in her book uh, lesbian love Sammy and Dotty got tired of backstage life and applause and decided to go into business. They came down to a famous neighborhood of the Metropolitan, looked around, got acquainted, and with the life savings they had put aside, rented a basement and named it the Flowery Teapot. Soon the two personalities attracted wide attention. Sammy is so masculine that even in her skirts, she is a puzzle to everyone. Impossible, strangers say. You can't tell me that this is a woman. Sammy with straightish, boyish figure, clean country lad's face and a mass of flaxen hair, vaselined and tightly brushed back is magnetic. Dotty is pretty and stout, with long fluffy black hair, black eyes. She also wears sleeveless gowns while Sammy struts her tightly fitted tailored suit and the inevitable attached collar and tie, which means so much in the life of a lesbian. The two often get publicity in current periodicals and a called husband and wife. Sammy smiles when she reads these articles while Dottie silently blushes. This flowery teapot has become very popular and interesting rendezvous for loving couples of the same sex, mostly the fair sex, where over a cup of tea lovers meet and wistfully look into each other's eyes, where new ones and lonely ones get acquainted and embrace each other, swaying to the melody of a dreamy waltz. And um, I would strongly recommend, given that I'm sure you've only heard half of what I said, that look for the article in the New Yorker on Eve Adams, read the book or listen to it on, it's also on Audible. It's Ned Katz, it, really really fascinating both for the life of um in uh new york um at that time but also for um life in europe um a kind of different side than we often hear um of life in europe in um in the lead up to um to the show after the holocaust um i'll stop the share and what i'll do is if you can still hear me that maybe i'll <laughs> see if i can answer you and answer any questions if they are but ned is probably much clearer than i am I actually have a question. Yes. Um, I got a bit confused because I think because the cut, sound kept cutting out at the beginning. But she was born in Europe and moved to America, or she was she was born, born in America in... and deported later, right? No, she was born in America. She was born in Poland and she went to America on right. her own, very very young, established this life, really supported herself. Um, total. I mean, she'd been a radical in Poland as well. She'd had a as a teenager. She had. Um, you know, we can see from her early writings, she really um, was already kind of mixing with anarchists and um, she was, um, she, you know, had clearly, I mean, I find it amazing and one so young, really, um, that she had kind of such a clearly formed sense of self um, and then went to the States and then she was deported from there back to Poland, which had been her life for a long time. Thank you. Um, everyone, you can now unmute yourselves if you'd like to chip in with a question as well. Yeah, or, I mean, uh, or by all means, use the chat. So nice to hear about the life of a lesbian leftist Jew as a queer leftist Jew, right? We also think that that's so, you know, my, you know, we don't hear enough about this history to know that actually there is a history of this, right? This, um, you've got some heritage, <laughs> and she's a great heritage, I think. Amazing. And I've just seen that like Ruth and Ellen are both unmuted, so I'm assuming we're about to get some questions, so I'm going to unpin myself. Yeah, Barbara, I think that's so sorry. I just want to respond to Barbara's about the plaque. I noticed that as well, right, that it's definitely not like in Berlin, for example, where you get plaques for a deportation, even though 
I mean, it was it was a uh, niece that she was deported from, but still, the, the, you know, from the years, it's so obvious that that's what happened. But um, yeah, not marked at all. Was she deported from America because she applied for citizenship? So this is really interesting. Um, it's it's hard to really like you can read huge transcripts in in Ned Cat's book. It gets something like three whole chapters to the court case, which went on for ages. There was a kind of almost a mistrial in the first one, and then there's a a second um, uh, kind of second hearing where her her solicitor doesn't even show up to, and um, it seems that part of the reason she was deported is that that they're implying that on that certificate when you answered all those questions that she was basically lying um both in terms of her politics and her sexuality um and that that was why um and that she didn't have and part of the reason then because actually that citizenship hadn't been granted was part of the reason she was able to be deported You're still muted, Tom. I am still muted. Um, I was going to say, are there any other questions? It shows whether you can use a physical hand because I can see you all. Or, uh... or just comments. Um, Marlowe's. All right. Yes. Hi. Thank you so much for this for this wonderful um, presentation. I was wondering. I'm 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 fascinated by the whole life of which I knew nothing. I have to admit. But um, I was I was really surprised, particularly at the start of her life in Poland, that apparently there was that that kind of subculture in Poland. Um, in America, yes, I I I should have I, yeah, I could have imagined that that existed there. But in Poland, that really surprised me. Maybe that's that says a lot about my bias. But maybe you can tell a little bit more about about that part of her life. What do we know about that? We know very little. What we know is kind of pieced together from some of these short stories and particularly the one that ends up in Lesbian Love, uh, where, uh, again, you know, I said at the beginning that it's thought that she was um, 19 because we only know that because in this short story where all the others, he's able to piece together the characters, which makes him make the assumption that this one takes place uh, in this artist colony actually really happened and it's a you know I can show you this this it's the very first uh, the very no it's the very last story of her book which is what she calls um she, she says how I found myself so it's a fairly good indication that it's about her and she says that she's traveling around Poland and she comes across artist's um, colony and she's walking through this artist colony and up on the balcony is this woman who says um, hello young boy and she uh oh I mean that we were just getting into that story sorry she says I'm back Can you oh she's back me? okay I don't know where she's gone but she is back okay she says hello young boy and she says I'm not a young boy. And she says, I know you're not a young boy, but maybe you want to come here and sit on my lap for a while. And she says, okay. And she comes and she sits on her lap and she sits there for hours and tells her about herself. And um, then they go to bed and she says, it was almost as if my body merged with, with hers. And I mean, just, it's beautiful. None of it. I mean, it's, um, you know, it's first love and first sexual experience and awakening and, um, but there's no, there's nothing that the most explicit, the interesting thing I found, I'll see if I can find it, is that the most explicit thing is they're like some of the, um, the pictures, they got her on that as well, like of some of the pictures of kind of, um, of even nudes that were in like this, I don't know if you can see, can you see? Yep, yep, we can see. Yep. They got her on that as well. Like that was seen as uh, obscene. But when you read it, in, also when you read it in the context, you know, it's they're very loving. It's um, anyway, the times. But that happened in Poland. Some of the other things I found interesting was just like how vicious they were. To, I mean, maybe again, like you say, we should know this, right? But 
how vicious they were to her because she crossed so many subsections of considered other, um, you know, in so many ways that 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 level of vitriol that came from the establishment um, was, and and really they were responsible for her ultimately. Like it said at the beginning, like it was the Nazis that killed her, but it was society that sent her to that to that place. The funny thing is though, even at that time and looking now, you know, there is still so much of it left. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, I think also the fact that I mean, she was, she was, you know, 1920s, 1930s um, and facing many of the same issues and, you know, gender and political politics that we're, we're still talking about um, today, absolutely. It's interesting also the contrast between her and her Jewish lesbian contemporaries Stein and Toklas, yes. who were of course, who also managed you know by, by you know survived and had absolutely were free of any persecution in a way you know they managed you know with living in Provence I mean they apparently even I think there were some property deals with occupying German <laughs> officers and things. But the difference between somebody who was essentially of the, the lower, less well-connected classes and the way they, they managed to survive, you know, I mean, in very, very comfortably. And yet she was also living probably just not that many miles away from where they were. And I think that definitely her poverty, her level of, I mean, just it's so profound that actually, you know, that really, really, I mean, I couldn't work out how she got to the point that she was able to open, you know, <laughs> a cafe um, in, in, you know, she, she was selling one minute, she's, you know, a kind of journalist and selling periodicals and yet she somehow manages to but, um, open this place in, in Greenwich Village. Um, but um, certainly when she went back to Europe, she was penniless. I mean, really, really like, and letters to I find so some of the most uncomfortable reads of the um, book is okay. her kind of letters to Ben talking about the money um especially when you know what happens in the end right <laughs>